Hello and welcome to State of the Economy. Uh, today we have with us Mr. N.C. Saxena, member of the National Advisory Council uh, who has done extensive work on poverty and, uh, and uh, public policy uh, related to delivery of uh, essential services. Uh, uh, and from him we'll try to uh, understand and decode uh, the heated debate uh, that we've witnessed on, on the poverty line and how to address the issue of uh, poverty in our country. Welcome to uh, our show, uh, Mr. Saxena. Thank you. Uh, to begin with, uh, could you just tell us why this uh, so much heat generated about about this poverty line or that poverty line, or whether the Tendulkar line is adequate or not? Uh, because one also hears that the Tendulkar Tendulkar line uh, uh, corresponds to uh, the poverty uh, line that the United Nations uh, follows or the World Bank follows. Uh, what exactly uh, is the issue here? Well, in fact, um, more than the poverty line, one should be looking at the expenditure of various classes. And the data collected by the NSSO, which is totally apolitical and a very credible organization, it does show that the consumption of the last three or four deciles in India has been improving at a faster speed during the last eight, nine years than it had done before. Which means that whatever is the poverty line, uh, you will find that the decline in poverty would be faster during the last eight years. Now, poverty line is an artificial construct. Uh, it is, uh, can be fixed anywhere. There are good arguments against uh, the present poverty line just as there are arguments in favor of the uh, poverty line. Let me look at the arguments in favor of this. First argument is that we cannot be changing poverty line every year or once in five years. We have chosen this poverty line in 1973-74, where we said that at that time it was to be 1.4 or 1.5 rupees, 1.5 rupees per day per capita, which has now become 27. Uh, so therefore, if you want to uh, see whether people are going up or going down and which states are doing better, you have to have the same poverty line. The other argument is that... It you're saying that you can't change the line very frequently. Very frequently. And the other point is that this is very close to the international poverty line of $1.25 a day because at the PPP value of dollar, which is 22 rupees today, it would come to about 27, 28. So it is at par with the rural poverty line and our urban poverty line is slightly above. But so this, is, this is what the UN Millennium Development Goal in regard to poverty also follows. That's right. They, they follow this. But there are arguments against this line also. Sure. Number one, in India today, you have to measure poverty not so much in terms of expenditure, but in terms of overall access to basic services. Because today you find in the cities especially, there are many people who are able to earn 100 or 200 rupees a day. Even a rickshawala today in the Raj Sabha TV, he said that he was earning 200 rupees a day. But he has no place to sleep. He has no shelter. He has no roof over his head. He has no access to sanitation or health or... or so you're saying there should be a bouquet of essential services. That's right. It should, should be, be delivered to people at a certain price. Multi-dimensional poverty must be measured in terms of several in the indicators and we should follow a multi-dimensional approach. The second point is, as incomes improve, our expectations also improve. Yeah. And therefore, today we find it uh, very difficult to uh, believe that people can live below 27 rupees uh, a day. In fact, I call it the kutta billy line because sure. only, only cats and dogs can live uh, below this. Perhaps even they cannot live. <laughs> Perhaps, yes, you are right. Given inflation in their food. Uh, that, that's right. In fact, the experience of countries like China or Malaysia or Thailand has been, which have been, uh, which are now in the middle income groups, that they have also moved away from $1.25 and they follow a $2 line. Okay, they moved up. They have, they entered power, and China says that poverty has gone up from 7% uh, to 13% because they have changed the poverty line. So therefore, we should also, therefore, first of all, um, uh, follow a multidimensional approach and peg it slightly higher. The third point here is that whatever line you have, it does not mean that people who are above that line are quite well off. 
in fact if you change the line to say 40 rupees a day uh, per then you will find that in rural india 50% of the people would be below the, that line so 40 40 per, uh, 40 rupees uh, is that threshold where median threshold similarly in urban areas today the median uh, income per day per capita is 70 rupees which means 70 ru uh, rupees if you are earning 71 rupees you are not entitled to food subsidy so that is the f uh, f uh, position so yeah. and here here mr Sina, i have one calculation based on nsso which says that that if you calculate the number of people earning say above 100 rupees a day per person a family of five so 500 rupees per day uh, it's just about 10 percent that's right 90 percent of the people that's right that's below right. 100 rupees that's right per person per day that's right of consumption that is uh, that is one point there, there is a slight problem here with data because generally what happens is when you ask a poor person he would not fudge what he consumes if you go to a rich person's house he would be scared of the income tax. So therefore, he may be earning 1,000 rupees a day, but he might say that he earns only 500 rupees a day. Okay, there could be a data. There could be some, therefore they find that distortion there. There is a difference between national accounts and national sample survey data. So that difference is accounted for because of the fudging done by the now, Coming back people. to the fundamental issue that you raised, uh, you're absolutely right. We need to evolve a new threshold uh, of consumption uh, which takes into account a bouquet of very essential services like yeah. you said yeah. a rickshawala may be earning 200 rupees a day but he may not have a, a, a one room or two room house to it's not even one room yeah may not have health yeah. facilities you know so how do we go about it how, how do we create this this new uh, l threshold of consumption well in fact uh, to begin with what one should do is we can have separate indicators for shelterless house people or for those who are bonded labor or for those who are living on the pavements that figure should also be highlighted and there should be good media debate because i find that when we talk of home houselessness they find that there are very few schemes no state is running for unorganized labor for instance yeah no state wants to do rental program rental housing no state wants to do sh uh, night shelters mm -hmm. because for a rickshawala who earns 200 rupees a day, mm -hmm. he cannot afford to buy it uh, a LIG house which will cost 20 lakhs. He doesn't have 20 lakhs, but he can easily afford to pay 50 rupees a day uh, for uh, for a night shelter. Renter. That is what we should be aiming at. Have more uh, rental programs. Have more uh, night shelters. Mm -hmm. In fact, after the Second World War. In most European countries, because of poverty, government had an ambitious program of uh, rental houses because they knew that people can't afford to buy a house. Okay. That's what we should be doing. We'll take a small break here. Uh, please don't go away and stay with us. Welcome back to State of the Economy. We are having a conversation with Mr. N.C. Saxena, member of the National Advisory Council who's done extensive work on poverty. Uh, Mr. Saxena, you, you were rightly uh, saying that we need to uh, evolve uh, a different uh, threshold of consumption uh, based on the real basic minimum needs of people, whether it's housing, health, food of course. Food is the very uh, minimum in terms of calorie intake on which the current poverty line is uh, based. Now, how do you administer uh, such a complex uh, set of uh, delivery uh, of, of services and, and goods, essential services and goods? Uh, I remember you telling me in our previous interviews that one of the biggest uh, and the most challenging issues in India uh, is identifying the poor. Now, how do you identify the poor in such a vast country? That's right. Yeah. In fact, there are two issues here. For, let me come to the first issue, that uh, where is the need for shifting to a multidimensional approach? Because if you look at India's uh, interstate poverty figures, you find that in the 60s and up to the beginning of 70s, Kerala and, and Tamil Nadu, they were, at, they were at the highest number of poor people. 
Okay. They were at the highest, in fact, much more than Bihar or Odisha was poverty in Kerala and Tamil Nadu. In the 60s? In the six, up to the 60s. Okay. In fact, if you look at the figure of the 70s, oh. even then you will find that these states were quite uh, uh, very high on poverty level. And now it's got reversed. Now it is just the reverse. Why? Because mm. both in Kerala and Tamil Nadu, mm. there was public action. There was public action to provide these services which I am talking of. Mm -hmm. The difference is that in Kerala there was demand, there was an active activist citizenry which mm -hmm. demanded mm -hmm. uh, these services and government had to give. Mm -hmm. In Tamil Nadu there was a supply driven program mm -hmm. and the two political parties, they were out of competition, they decided to you know, outdo the other okay. and announce a large number of programs. So demand driven versus supply driven, but in both cases you had public action. Public so action. therefore, mm -hmm. there has to be public action in India too, mm -hmm. to improve our sanitation or housing or water. In fact, there are programs, but they are not but being running very well. Do you think, Mr. Saxena, uh, it's very interesting what you said, Kerala and Tamil Nadu until the 1960s, well, um, poverty levels are much higher than in Bihar, yes, UP. Yes, that's now, right. Do you yeah. think in the last 40, 50 years, it changed in Kerala and Tamil Nadu because politics itself became more broad-based, uh, involving women, literacy, women's literacy, uh, gender equality. Uh, do you think these are some of the issues which might have helped uh, the yes, southern states to improve certainly it, so rapidly? Cert certainly, but these uh, higher literacy, uh, etc., they have, there's a time lag. Okay. So therefore, Kerala had a high literacy even in the 50s and 60s. Okay. But at that point of, till that point of time, mm -hmm. higher literacy was not leading into, lot lead into growth. Okay. But that helped because when opportunities increased mm -hmm. in the Middle East or in India, mm -hmm. you know, Kerala women could go out. So therefore, literacy was the one factor mm -hmm. which which helped Keralaites in getting more jobs and yeah. improving their lives. Tamil Nadu? Tamil Nadu, what happened was that Tamil Nadu government had a large number of populist programs. Midday mid, um, day meal program yeah. started from there. ICDS uh, was a big uh, In fact, many there. of these programs began from the south. From the south. I remember at one time there. we used to ridicule them, but now everybody is following That's them. Right. Yeah. Tamil Nadu followed a very good uh, policy of not allowing their uh, um, uh, interest burden to become very high. So their okay. fund management was very good. And the tax collection is very good. Yeah, yeah. Compare Tamil Nadu with West Bengal, mm -hmm. both almost at the same level of industrial development. Yeah, yeah. In Tamil Nadu, the tax GDP ratio is 15 percent, but whereas in West Bengal, it is only 5 percent. So therefore, you find that the mm -hmm. per capita plan expenditure, mm -hmm. per capita expenditure on social sector is least in West Bengal, is one of the highest in Tamil Nadu. In spite of having a communist government there? That's right. They did not believe in collecting years, yeah. taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is a, it is a bizarre situation that mm -hmm. A communist government was borrowing money from PLS insurance. They were borrowing money from Haldi Rams. Yeah. And so therefore, they, their in, uh, interest burden is very, very high. Yeah. Now, coming to the uh, second point that you, uh, that there is a identification is a real challenge. Yeah. Because unfortunately, there has been a lot of debate on how many poor, oh. but not enough debate on who are the poor who are and the poor? how to identify them. Yeah. Government but had we asked have the socio-economic and caste. That's survey. right. I'm coming to that. Oh. See, the government has now come up with the socio-economic caste census. Okay. This, the whole methodology is flawed mm -hmm. because what happens is in a, this is based on the census methodology. In census, when a surveyor comes to me and asks me, "Are you graduate?" I'll say, "Yes, I'm a graduate." Mm -hmm. "Are you living in a two-bedroom house?" I said, "Yes, I'm living in a two-bedroom house." Mm -hmm. If I know that the surveyors uh, will ask me questions and my answer will determine mm -hmm. whether I am BPL or not, then I say, no, sir, I am not graduate. I am fifth fail. Mm -hmm. Or I will. I am not living in this big house. This belongs to someone else. Mm -hmm. I live in a hut. What about assets? Will they lie so about assets? For, they, could, they could do all that. They could do all that. Or the surveyor himself will say, Mr. Saxena, you may give me 1,000 rupees and I will... Uh, write the correct answers. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I am not very uh, hopeful about this caste survey correct, doing correct uh, assessment. My own recommendation was that this work must be done by the Gram Sabha. Okay. By, we have to involve the people. Because in an open uh, uh, house, it will be more transparent. More transparent, then you will say, okay, these are the ten. So everybody poorest. knows who's That's got how, many, right. how much assets That's right. and who's more deserving. That's right. Unfortunately, the 
methodology that we have followed is flawed. But there is one good point that because in the food security now, 75% of rural people will get uh, uh, food subsidy, therefore the scope of the poor being left out would become smaller. Because if you are selecting only 20%, then it is chances are that the poor would get left out. If you are selecting 75 percent, mm -hmm. then their chances of getting left out would become much less. Much less. Much okay. less. So that is the one good thing because of which there would be, I think, some improvement. In so any case, now you find that in the PDS, mm -hmm. in during the last 10 years, mm -hmm. states have made very good efforts. Very good. And the latest NSSO data shows that leakages, which were 55 percent in 2004-2005 mm -hmm. have now come down to 30 okay. percent. So there are still leakages very high in Bihar, very high in the Northeast, mm -hmm. very high in Delhi and UP. I am told the leakages are minimum up to the BPL category <coughs> but in the APL leakages become very high. Yeah, in fact leakages are minimum in the AAY category, mm -hmm. Antyodhya and Yojana category yeah. but they are very high in the APL because APL is not a very uh, fixed quota. quota. Uh, it, um, if I am APL, I will never so, know. So, do you think this will change under the food security this, bill? This will change for two reasons. Number one, because the number of people who are getting it would be higher. Yeah. Number 67 two, percent 67 average. percent. Oh. Number two, because a large number of states have taken good steps mm -hmm. to rationalize and to improve PTS. And they include not only states like Chhattisgarh, mm -hmm. but also Rajasthan, uh, Odisha, Himachal Pradesh, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh. So therefore, there are many states which have taken good steps, so much so mm -hmm. that many states on their own mm -hmm. have decided to announce a lower price. So they are subsidizing from their own sources, okay. which can be done by states which are rich in mineral resources like Jharkhand or Odisha. Sure. Unfortunately, it can't be done by Bihar, uh, where PDS is in a very bad shape, very bad because shape. Bihar is also doesn't have the kind of revenues which mineral rich states have. Okay. We'll take a small break here, sir. Uh, please don't go away and uh, stay with us. Welcome back to State of the Economy. We are having a conversation with Mr. N.C. Saxena, member of National Advisory Council. Uh, Mr. Saxena, you, you very rightly pointed out how different states behave differently uh, when implementing some of these schemes and do you think the process of identifying the poor should, uh, instead of being a top-down process, should be left to the states and states should be made responsible and, and panchayats at those two levels. Uh, they should identify the poor and the center should merely play a facilitating role. Well, theoretically, the exercise under SCCC is being done by the states. So if you ask the ministry, they will always say that identification is being done by the states. But the methodology and the whole process and the funding has come from the center. The problem with the too much centralization is that uh, it then distorts the state's own initiative. And so you believe that there is centralization? I think there is centralization, uh, too much of centralization in this. The Rural Development Ministry handles it, right? That's right. But the other problem and the other issue is that the states, unfortunately, do not have much faith in their own panchayas. In fact, the states are dominated by the interests of the MLAs. And MLAs look at panchayas as a competitor. So therefore, uh, they, uh, none of the states, except for one or two, uh, leave out Kerala and Karnataka, etc., mm -hmm. you'll find other states may not involve Gram Sabhas and panchayas. So that's a danger. Uh, but but so then you said, uh, if gra you said Gram Sabha should be involved, yeah. but in some states, Gram Sabha may not work. May not work. But therefore, it is important that Gram Sabhas, there has to be some kind of a uh, joint effort. That is, the list be prepared first by uh, uh, government officials, then it goes to the Gram Sabha, and then Gram Sabha, and then the, there should be some kind of an open discussion, and there should be transparency. Do you think uh, that we could have a, a, a two-speed system, uh, like one dealing with states, uh, which are generally advanced and have better governance, where even Gram Panchayats work like the southern states. Yeah. And you have a different set of, uh, different system there. And you actually uh, ring fence the northern states where things are really bad right. and give special focus there, 
evolve special systems, special governance. Uh, is that a possibility? Of course. Rather than you have just one set of system yeah. for uh, the one, entire one can, one can easily have uh, good monitoring teams. We have in India a large number of good professional organizations yeah, sure. and they are not only located in Delhi or Mumbai, they are spread all over India. Yeah. They can be made in charge of finding out and monitoring and reporting on a uh, frequent basis. Especially for northern states. For, for northern states. Because they are not required so for that, Kerala, Tamil yeah, Nadu that, and Andhra yeah, Pradesh. That's right. Yeah. So wherever you find the progress is not good, you should pay special effort. Unfortunately, in India, the reverse happens. Once you know a program is not doing well, whether it is PDS, whether it is malnutrition, whether it is uh, a lack of uh, uh, because anemia, you find that whatever evaluation was being done has been given up. For instance, you know, National Family Health Survey uh, came out with a figure of 44% malnutrition. You find that after 2006-2007, we have not done, we have not engaged uh, with the National Family Health Survey. So therefore, it has to be you know, we need to focus where things are not working. In fact, you're, you're, so, you're so right when you say this. I have seen that even World Bank tends to focus more in states where governance is already better, where things might work. So they would, uh, they would have bigger programs in uh, those states rather than in Bihar, UP, where things are bad. Uh, but uh, there's a need to attempt. Uh, much more in yeah, these states, yeah. right? Yeah, in fact, one should be able to persuade even the World Bank to concentrate much more on the poorer states. But World Bank, after all, is a bank. So they have to be uh, concerned with the, you know, delivering and finding out good results. But at least government of India must, um, because they invest much more in poorer states, right. they have to focus attention why things are not working in UP or Jharkhand or Assam. These are the Lagarde states and we need to really concentrate on them. Plus the other big problem which you have uh, spoken about in the past is that how, uh, because for instance the southern states have better governance, so there is much more offtake of food grains there, whereas uh, more food grains are required for the poor in Bihar and UP. Yeah, yeah. Now when you implement the food security bill, necessarily there will need to be a bigger transfer of food grain supply from better off states to the poorer states. Now, politically, I am told that this will be a difficult exercise because I spoke to the food minister who said that it'll be, it may be difficult to withdraw uh, uh, food uh, distribution to better off people in Kerala and the state would bear the cost of that. Now, how, would, how, how will we manage uh, this big shift towards the poorer states? It's a very big problem because the total amount of food to be given is limited. It's about 60, 65 million tons. And therefore, if you are going to follow uh, the 67 percent formula, uh, this 67 percent would not be 67 percent all over the states. It would be maybe 75 percent in Bihar and only 60 percent in, in, in Tamil Nadu. Maybe Nord, Punjab Kerala. only 30 percent. In Punjab maybe much less. Unfortunately, you find that in the PDS, much more food grain is going today to richer states. Mm -hmm. uh, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Delhi, the Northeast, Jammu and Kashmir, these are the preferred states because of historical In reasons. a sense, it's not justified, no? It's not justified. Mm -hmm. Now, therefore, what will happen is that Kerala and Tamil Nadu will suffer. They will not be able to get the full quota. Mm -hmm. Unless Government of India starts giving them a special quota, or these states import rice from uh, from Vietnam or Thailand mm. or government of India should totally stop exports. We are exporting 12 million tons of rice and wheat every year which is being eat eaten by cattle in Europe with that we should stop and feed our own people. So if we have, if we want to really uh, not annoy and create a political problem uh, for the uh, ruling government then we need to really stop exports so that these states also get Otherwise, there is going to be a lot of uh, anger and uh, frustration uh, in these uh, southern states and because they'll certainly find that their quota has been reduced. So this is a problem which, we, which will need to be tackled. Uh, right. uh, thank you, Mr. Saxena, for talking to us. Uh, uh, that's all we have in this uh, edition of State of the Economy. Uh, we'll be back with you next week. Thanks for watching.